Welcome to the Exit Rich Podcast, where the leading authority on buying, selling, fixing, and growing companies, Michelle Seiler Tucker, is dedicated to helping you find the path to retire rich and move on to your next adventure by exiting your business for the desired dream price you deserve. Get ready to exit rich with your host, Michelle Seiler Tucker. Jay, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here on my Exit Rich podcast. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you so much for giving us a testimonial on my new book that's coming out called Exit Rich. I greatly appreciate that. Nah, it really hits on a topic that a lot of people don't think about, and uh, you cover it uh, in great depth. I do. I do. Me and Sharon Lecter. You're familiar with Sharon Lecter, right? Yeah. Yep. So her and I wrote a 325 page book on everything you need to know about exiting. So you have a couple of great books under your belt and you obviously have had a lot of amazing accomplishments, which I can't help to wonder what Jay Samet was as a little boy. <laughs> what um, were you like as a little boy and how did you get started? So I didn't set out to be an entrepreneur and start companies that I sell for billions of dollars. Um, and have multiple exits. I started out as not really figuring it out. And when I, by the time I got out of college, a couple of years, I had two small kids and I wanted my sons to have a great life. And that's what pushed me forward. And what I realized after dozens of your friends become self-made billionaires, that they didn't go to the right schools, they didn't go to the right you know, families, they didn't have connections. Most don't come from money and it can be taught. And every 48 hours, every 48 hours, there's a new self-made billionaire. That's what the B. So they have the same time as we do. What do they do differently? And so I wrote Disrupt You to teach people how to do that. It was the greatest experience of my life, as you'll find out with your book. Because you hear from people all over the world that it's changed their lives. And it's now coming out in Polish and Urdu and Icelandic and crazy languages. Wow. Um, but I didn't reach everybody. And occasionally I'd get an email saying, this is motivational, but I can't do it. So I decided to put my, my reputation, my life out there and play Pygmalion. And I took a young man who grew up on welfare, was couch surfing, staying at different friends' houses. And I mentored him for one day a week for a year. I gave him no cash. I didn't tell him what business to start. And I gave him no contacts, a complete fair level playing field. And to kind of give away the ending of uh, Future Proofing You, he became a self-made millionaire in under a year. Wow. And what the mentor sessions went down to is what I call 12 truths. If you follow these 12 truths, you will be successful. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying you just kick back. I'm not trying to sell masterminds or seminars. I'm not trying to sell anything. I use a publisher because that gets my, my thoughts out to the most people but it's really doable. And so this young man, Vin, was willing to work harder than most for a year so he can live the rest of his life the way most can. Mm -hmm. And he's future-proof. Whatever, whatever the economy changes, whatever disruption comes from pandemics or things in the future, he now has the tools within him to be successful. And so, this is what taught. Yeah, I always say do what's hard and life becomes easy. Do what easy. what's easy and life becomes hard, right? True. Yeah. So it all starts off with mindset, you know, getting a growth mindset. So what was funny is I didn't let Vin read the book until it was already typeset because he discovered when he read it that our relationship actually started out with a lie. I lied to him. And there's an effect called the Pygmalion effect where there was a professor who went to school, tested all the kids and told the teachers, these three kids would be super learners. They'd learn so much this year and grow. And at the end of the year, they gave a test. And lo and behold, those three kids were amazing, super learners. Turns out the professor lied. That first test, he never looked at. He picked three names at random. But if you tell people they're special, they act special and they respond. So given that I wanted Vin to achieve this in a year, I needed to trick him into having a growth mindset that he never had before. So when I first met him, I said, I interviewed hundreds of people. And of all the people, he's the only one with all the right characteristics to make this happen. And so he's looking at this old, you know, wealthy guy believes it, then maybe I have it. And so by making him feel that somebody else believes, he learned to believe. And then in his first 30 days, when he made more than $50,000, 
he believed. <laughs> I bet he did. What, so what are those characteristics? What, what did he have that, that somebody else doesn't have? What oh, makes... I just made that up. I never interviewed oh, anybody oh. else. Okay. So that's it, the it, part that you lied to him about. Yeah. It, it would have been cheating if I cherry picked the perfect person. You know, I'm going to teach anybody to play golf. Tiger Woods, come over here. Right. No, that, that's not fair. I just took somebody at random, but gotcha. made mm-hmm. them feel special. And Tom Bill, you, I think, you know, Tom, Tom wrote the, the forward to the book and Tom wrote something really powerful in his forward. He wrote, I believe in you to the, to the, to the reader he says, I don't have to have no met you. Humans are amazing. We're adaptable. We can achieve anything we put our minds to. So if no one's ever told you this, I believe in you. And there's power with that mm-hmm. because so many teachers told you that you can't, or your parents wanted to shield you from failing. And failing is the key to success. You learn what doesn't work. It's like playing a video game. You get to the obstacle, you die, you go figure that out, get to the next one, and you fail your way to the top. And that's how Jeff Bezos, who you know I worked with in the, in the late 90s, how he could lose money year after year after year after year after year and come out the other side as the richest man in the world. Right. So in this book, I also wanted to explain to people where money comes from. There's such a, 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 a misunderstanding. When you and I were in school, we were taught, Jay buys a banana for a dollar, I sell it to you for $2, and that's how I make a dollar. Mm-hmm. But that mindset is called zero-sum game. It means the only way I get money is if I take money from you. Mm-hmm. And if you start with that mindset, then you believe they got the raise, so I'm not getting it. I don't like that person. These people are taking our jobs. That country's taking our jobs. Robots. Everybody becomes the enemy. Whereas if I went to you and said, I'm starting a new company and I sell you 10% for $10,000, what do I now have? I now have 90% of the company. I have $90,000. It mm-hmm. wasn't created in equity. That wasn't created by the Federal Reserve. I can hire people with that. I can buy things. I can merge companies with it. And that's where wealth is created out of thin air, like a philosopher's stone. So you could do it the old fashioned way, Warren Buffett, brilliant investor worth 80 plus billion dollars, but he made 99% of that after he was 50. Mm. Or he can do it the Kylie Jenner way and become a billionaire at 22. And he can say, well, she had a famous family. Yeah, there weren't any billionaires in that family. So what are people doing different? How can I learn to do this? How can I learn to leverage fear? How can, how can I find mentors? That's something I didn't talk about in the first book. You can't do it on your own. Mm. That mythology, and I was guilty of this. I used to run the world's record labels, you know, all the artists that you can think of. And when you see that artist alone on a stage, you feel that connection from their heart to yours. It's just this one person, they did it on their own. You don't see the songwriters, the musicians and the arrangers and the roadies and the stylists and makeup and managers and agents, Mm -hmm. hundreds of people to make it look like the person's there by themselves. Well, I don't know a single person that made it to the top on their own. Even Mother Teresa found her mentor while sitting on a a bus bench. Mm -hmm. So you can find mentors on LinkedIn. And it's not sending the email that I'm sure you get that I get all the time. Will you be my mentor? (laughs) Uh, Will you be my friend like Roger's Neighborhood? (laughs) It's really about finding people. And I tell you how to look through their backgrounds to see what works starting a dialogue, commenting on things that they write or post and developing that relationship the same way you would with a real relationship. And you'll be amazed how many people would like the validation of being able to help people and how many people would like to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. And so, so I was able to do that for Vin as a way to then write it down and scale it for everybody. So if you, you know, too many people right now feel left out left behind, you know, surviving on leftovers. You know, the bottom 140 million Americans own less than 1% of everything in the country. 140 million people. Life is, is, is set up to be hard. You were taught to be a factory worker and factories employ robots. So how can I teach people that they have it within them? And that's my mission. Interesting. So what are the, what are the characteristics to make somebody 
really successful. You take two people, somebody's really successful and somebody's not. Maybe somebody went to college, has a great pedigree, great education. The other person has a troubled past, horrible childhood, you know, never really had any mentors. And why would this person be more successful than this person? What makes so, somebody more successful than someone so else? So some of the myths that I, 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 you know, explode in the book is college graduates from top universities don't end up wealthier than people that don't go to college. That era disappeared. Um, having a higher IQ doesn't make you end up wealthier. So forget that, that you only need two things to be successful, insight and perseverance. Mm -hmm. I can teach insight. I have my, my three problems a day for 30 day technique that will get you more deal flow than the biggest VC. And you'll find that. And then persistence can be honed and cultivated. And in future proofing you, I really explain how to take what you're persistent about and turn it into passion. Passion will get you further. Mm -hmm. Passion will see you through those obstacles that just seem insurmountable at the time. And so at the, at the very beginning, the first stage is that growth mindset. Some people go, wow, uh, I failed the real estate test. I'll never be a realtor. I'm not smart enough. Other people will take the same test and fail and go, okay, I didn't learn these things. If I learn these things, then I will pass. You know, every time you fail in business, it's not that you can't do it. It's you learn something that doesn't work mm -hmm. and you don't end up where you started. That's the other thing people don't understand. You either earn or you learn. Mm -hmm. So each time you try, you learn more skills. VCs would rather invest in somebody that's had a failed business than somebody that's never tried it before. Because it's that process of learning what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And no one just suddenly fully formed sits there like, you know, and invents the flux capacitor. It's not about inventing it. And it's not about selling. It's about solving a problem. Mm -hmm. Solve for a few people, you have friends. Solve for a million, become wealthy. And I've lived the solve for a billion and you change the world. It is, we're one click away from 7 billion people. Think of the impact you can have with your ideas. Yeah, so you also talk about how to create a digital business without any capital, without any working capital whatsoever. Tell us about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So first off, and I have a chapter on this, every business is digital. If you don't think your business is digital, you're wrong. I'll fight you to the death on it. And the greatest example is if you go back 10 years and I give you a million dollars, to put and buy the most successful tech stock of the past 10 years. Who would you buy? Apple? No. Facebook? No. Google? No. Turn over all the cards. The most successful tech, tech comp company whose stock has done the best? Domino's. You go, Domino's? How's that a tech company? Well, the second they became app centric, the majority of their employees work on technology. They can get insights faster from users. They can see trends. They can see tastes. They can more efficiently do their supply chain. They can get rid of uh, employees. They are a tech-centric business. Mm -hmm. Making pizza is the easiest part of that business. Customer mm -hmm. acquisition, retention. So what problem are you going to solve? So in Vin's case, he came to me and had a skill set that most millennials feel they have. I know social media, I could do social media marketing for people. Well, go in line behind the 40 million people that already have a million followers. People know how to do this. So what if you take those skill set instead of marketing some generic thing and like you're not gonna get Coca-Cola when you're a kid with no track record as a client and the only people you know have no money. So, I mean, you're in that dead end. What if you find a niche that no one else is focused on? Mm -hmm. And I'm competitive, but I hate competition. I know on any day there's somebody better looking, smarter, better connected, richer. You know, the competition doesn't sleep. I don't want to compete. But if I'm the only person in the world doing what I'm doing, by definition, I'm the best. So I asked him to start looking and a, and a good mentor doesn't tell you what to see. He just points you where to look. Mm -hmm. oh, where is there a trend that the press is talking about? Where is something new that everybody's talking about? And then stake your flag in the sand that you are the best social media marketer of that little T 
teeny niche. So in his case, it was the year that Bitcoin went from $1,000 to $20,000. Everybody's talking cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency, you know. And the second Bitcoin did that, thousands of entrepreneurs decided they were going to create their own coins and do what's called an ICO, an initial coin offering, mm -hmm. where you can make literally a billion dollars out of thin air overnight. But anybody with brains knows that that window was going to close really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And the government was going to get rid of the hucksters and it was going to be really small. So all of a sudden, all these people that wanted to get their ICO out needed somebody that knew how to market ICOs. So Vin just created the world's greatest agency, solely focused on that. He got one client. He would have done it for free to prove it. That client made $58 million in a month from the marketing that he did. Now you have a case study. And with that case study, they lined up around the block. So the same thing he used to charge $200 for, he can now charge $30,000 for. Mm -hmm. Same amount of work, same amount of hours. And that market can come and go, but that approach works again and again because there's always something new. And did he have any experience? He had no experience in that industry, right? None. None. So he learned it as he went, basically. Well, he lived it because he was yeah. a millennial. He understood things. Um, he'd been hired once to do a campaign when uh, he's uh, from London. I also wanted the fish out of water that had no support network, no friends, and I'm in Los Angeles. There was a, a, a bar, a pub that was opening. And you can imagine in London, advertising in a major city like that is super expensive, and there's a, rents are expensive. And if your restaurant doesn't you know, hit day one, you're out of business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he got hired to, to do that. And what he realized was you're not going to compete for keywords and everything else. There's always somebody with more money. Go where nobody else is. The same idea. And I have a whole chapter on filling voids in Future Proofing You. So what he did is he grabbed some photos of nice looking women and nice looking guys, the kind of people you'd want to meet at a bar because you mm -hmm. go to a bar to meet people and put them on Tinder. <laughs> and when people like them, he said, hey, I'm not real, but I'm at, you know, this, the, we're the kind of people that would be at this place. And everybody liked the joke, just like you did. It spoke to the moment. It spoke to the truth of that generation. And the place was a hit. So that's, that's brilliant. That's genius. So it's not that you don't have to do the work, but it's just as hard to work on something that doesn't scale as something that can become a billion dollars. I've mm -hmm. sat in an empty room and done the first auction and you wake up and it's eBay or sat down with Reid Hoffman and LinkedIn. And so I've seen what that is. And I've run companies where you do hundreds of billions of dollars a year and you have hundreds of thousands of employees and you want to shoot yourself. Um, <laughs> now you want to so shoot them. <laughs> Now it's, it's more the, the, you know, everybody complains how much CEOs get paid, but in reality, most of them get paid very little. They have a, per, a performance bonus tied to some metric. So their sole job is how do I make that metric, which gets back to exit rich. When I was a public CEO, I have to make it as profitable as possible. So don't spend money on future products or R&D. You're in the 16 week hamster wheel of what are my quarterly earnings? What are my quarterly earnings? And if I hit those numbers, I get paid millions. Mm -hmm. So that's what every CEO is doing. So it would be better for them to overpay to acquire a company that's already doing what they want to do than to develop it themselves. That's right. And that's why companies will buy com companies that have zero revenue mm -hmm. just to acquire the team, just to get into that market. And I'm chairman of a company and I'm going to do this again right now. Um, there's a sector that I know None of the people that should be developing stuff aren't. So we're doing the hard, heavy lifting, get it to a size where it's worth a billion dollars for somebody else to buy it as opposed to do it. And I mean, when advertising, when nobody was watching TV anymore and everybody's skipping through commercials, what do you think that does to people sitting in the C-suites at television networks? Terrifies them. Yeah, Their whole business is, is getting those eyeballs paid for. So I started, I uh, was CEO of a uh, digital ad platform mm -hmm. that came up with a new way to reach people and get better engagement. Is that and, Deloitte Digital? Is that Deloitte Digital? No, no. That was uh, mm -hmm. Social Vibe. And 18 months later, we sold it to News Corp for $200 million. 
never made a penny in profits. Mm -hmm. It's it's really about solving that problem for somebody that needs it. That's right. You're building those synergies. It's the same reason that Facebook paid $19 billion for WhatsApp and WhatsApp was hemorrhaging money, right? WhatsApp yeah, but was more importantly, money. the creator of WhatsApp applied for a job at Facebook and would have given the idea away for free and was turned down, you know? And he yeah. and they found it. They had a billion users, right? They had over a billion yeah. users. That's why Facebook paid nineteen billion dollars. What a great so there's story! Many a time, and only one VC was in that, and he did right. great. So there's many a time where there's somebody else that can better monetize what you've done, but you put the pieces together. So it's speed to market for them to buy you, and if mm -hmm. they just try to copy you and rip you off, then their competitor will buy you. Mm -hmm. I mean, look mm -hmm. at look at Dollar Shave Club. Yep. Why didn't one of the big Unilever, Procter and Gamble's ever figure out how to have a direct relationship with their customers so they could sell stuff and not go through through the middle person and have that reoccurring revenue? Yep. So that's the other thing. So you don't have to invent something new. You just have to solve a problem using something that somebody else invented. Right. Right. And that takes insight, like you said. You have to be creative. You have to have tremendous insight. You have to pay attention, right? And the only competitive advantage a company has in the 21st century is getting insight from their data faster than their competition. So even your smallest business has data mm -hmm. and they're not using it. And I'll give you an example back to how I started. So I'm old enough that when I came out of school, the new movie was Star Wars. Oh my God, that was the most amazing movie. I know what I want to do with my life. I want to make computer graphics in Hollywood. That would be so much fun. A couple of problems. I knew nothing about computers. I knew nothing about graphics. And I knew no one in Hollywood. Other than that, my plan was flawed. <laughs> so what did I need to get? I needed data. I needed to figure out that business. Mm -hmm. So before the internet, there's trade publications. Hollywood Reporter, I take out a blind ad pretending I'm a production company describing an entry-level job. And I got a bunch of resumes and that resume gave me two key pieces of data to launch my career. One, what will my resume need to look like to get one of these jobs? And two, here's a whole bunch of people with one foot out the door. So all those companies are about to have an opening. Wow. Here's the modern version. And, and you wrote. came up with that all on your own. Yeah. See? So, so here's, here's the 21st century version. Uh, a young man out of college gets, gets, wants to be mad men, wants to go into advertising, how creative, how much fun, gets a job with one of the big five multinationals, and he's now sitting in a cube tabulating numbers. You know, It's the most boring drudgery. It'll take him years to get promoted, get noticed. He hates his life. But he notices on Google that the most famous creative directors of the heads of the big agencies no one's bought their names as keywords. So for $9, the equivalent of, you know, a Mac, uh, you know, a, a, a Big Mac and fries, mm -hmm. he bought their keywords. And whenever they Google themselves, because famous people have to check that nothing bad's written about them. It said, hey, I really want to work for you. Click here to see my portfolio. Three of the five called him in. All three offered him jobs. He made five times his salary and accelerated his career by 20 years for a $9 investment. Wow. That's amazing. So those are those techniques and strategies that you write about in your new book, right? Yeah. So Disrupt You, was that a New York Times bestseller? Uh, it was a New York Times bestseller, but it's been bestseller. It was number one in Australia. It was number one in Korea. Um, it's now in a whole bunch of languages and it continues to sell. Um, to get New York Times, it has to be through physical stores in a very narrow window. Yeah. Of the mm -hmm. nonfiction category, 80 to 90% of the books that you see on the New York Times list paid to be there. Mm. there there's services, you can write a check, all your politicians, you go, who would buy these stupid books? No one, it, it, it's a racket. And they were even taken to court to prove that it wasn't real numbers. Because remember the movie, The, the Exorcist? Mm -hmm. Of course. That book sold more than any other book, hands over, for a long time and the movie made it even more and it never appeared on their list. Well, it's also more about just the numbers. It's also, they have all these boxes you have to check, but I think Disrupt You would definitely, should definitely made it to the list. 
it made it made Amazon's bestseller list. I yeah, mean, of course. Um, so, you know, there's so many businesses. I, I'm sure you know this. You know, when I wrote my first book in 2013, Sell Your Business for More Than It's Worth, 95% of all startups will go out of business. But when I wrote Exit Rich in 2020, that landscape has changed dramatically. Now it's only 30% will go out of business. However, out of 27.6 million companies, those that have been in business 10 years or longer, 70% of those businesses are going out of business. The business owners are selling for pennies on the dollar, closing their drawers, or even worse, filing bankruptcy. And you know, you hear about the public store, public companies like Toys R Us, been in business 75 years, goes out of business, Kmart, Steinmart, Pier One, Godiva, our favorite chocolate, <laughs> is closing down 1,500 locations. Why do you think that is? I have my own philosophy, but I'd love to hear from you. So there, there's a couple of things. First of all, too many entrepreneurs are spending or buried working in their business instead of on their business. Yep, that's one thing I always say. Yep. So when you start a business, you have to start with the premise of who are you building this business for? Not just for the customer, but who are you solving a hole of somebody that would buy it? Mm -hmm. And if you don't know before you open your doors who would buy it, and why are you starting it? It's a ton of work. Um, you're also talking about we live in an era of endless innovation where things change very, very quickly. And big companies fall over because they're dinosaurs and they can't, you know, can't, can't maneuver as, as quickly. But a lot of people, the biggest mistake that I see as far as exiting is I've seen as early as 30 days. I had two uh, young people that uh, I was mentoring. In their first 30 days in business, somebody came out of the blue and offered them $100 million for their company. It is the only time I've raised my voice in my professional career when they said, no, we're going to be billionaires. We're not taking it. I'm like, you're in your 20s, $100 million. What can you buy with a billion that you couldn't buy with 100 million? And as I knew from experience, they're not the center of attention forever. Within the year, there's 22 competitors. They've now had to raise 50, 60 million dollars, been watered down that if they sold for a billion today, they'd have less in their pocket and it's seven years later. So most of the time, your first offer will be your best offer. Mm -hmm. So how to evaluate an offer, how to understand it, how to negotiate, how not to get crushed in the 24 hours before closing when they mm -hmm. suddenly go, you know, you've been thinking about this number in your head, I'm getting $50 million. Oh, you tell your, your spouse and your family, I'm getting $50 million. Oh, I can't wait to spend my $50 million. And the night before closing, you will get a call that, you know, our board, there's market conditions have changed. Da, da, da. We're going to pay you 32 million. And you go, wait a second, the paperwork says, yeah, well, it isn't signed yet. We're not, not closed due diligence. And most people will grab their ankles and, and uh, you know, get, get screwed out of millions in the last uh, 48 hours of a deal. Um, I've had deals go south for the craziest reasons. I mean, we had one company where we each had spent over $20 million on due diligence. It was a months long process. And without revealing anything that I'm not allowed to, the CEO of one of the companies just got in a foul mood with his head of acquisitions that was doing the deal and wanted to punish the guy. Jeez. <laughs> and I mean, the champagne wasn't just bought, it was on ice. I mean, we had already had to notify the SEC because one of the companies was public. I mean, all that stuff that we're talking about, you know, one second before, you know, launch. Um, but you can figure this stuff out and th things change. The, the one that I write about in my chapter on, on, on exits is a deal that was, you know, shocking. The guy who created StubHub, there were two guys that created it. They had a falling out on direction, one left, and he went to Europe, just took the first flight and created the duplicate thing in Europe. It became huge. And then he got big enough to be able to buy StubHub and merge the two together. Multi-billion dollar business, February of 2020. Mm. Pandemic comes. There are no Broadway plays. There are no concerts. There are no sports games. You have now have the biggest collection of bankruptcy that you can ever have, the worst deal. Um, uh, uh, Forbes wrote it was the worst deal in the history of deals. Now, for eBay, which sold StubHub, it was the most brilliant deal ever. They have an asset that's going to turn into zero, and they're getting billions and billions for it. 
So timing. You timing is control, everything. You can't control timing, but you can mitigate risk. Right. Right. I agree a thousand percent. And I've done over a thousand transactions, my company and I, and you're right. They can fall apart for any reason whatsoever, especially right up to the, to the hour that they're supposed to sign papers. <laughs> I always tell my clients, don't count your money. Don't start spending yep. your money until it's in the bank. Yep. So tell us about your new book. When is it um, going to be out? So it's available on Amazon now, uh, Future Proofing You. And uh, really, again, I, I'm just writing to pay it forward to help people. Uh, there's the audio book, the, the Kindle, you know, all the, the different versions. Uh, just in English now, takes publishers longer overseas. But it really, it filled in some of the blanks from Disrupt You of giving people the step-by-step. -step. That's why I switched with Wiley. Wiley is a publisher known for those step-by-step -step type things. To take somebody from anywhere, from, from welfare to making a million dollars a year. And there's no secret sauce. There's no, you know, sit under a pyramid and, and, and say, um, you know, it's really practical, tried and true and proven. And this pandemic has been hard on small businesses. This has been hard on most people. The 150 wealthiest people in the world doubled their wealth this past year. Not doubled their income, doubled their Double wealth. wealth. Right. right? And the bottom half and the middle is getting squeezed out. So the reason I spend whatever time I have left on this planet trying to teach people to be successful is you only have a democracy if you have a stable middle class. Mm -hmm. Governments don't create jobs, entrepreneurs create jobs. And so unless we teach people how to build businesses, we have a very bleak future. Amen. And especially with 70% with of businesses going out of business, They've been in business for 10 years or longer. And I always say the reason they're going out of business is, business is because they stop AIM, which is always innovate and market. So many of these business owners keep doing things the same way that they've always done them. What, what's your prediction over the next five years, especially given the pandemic? Where, where do you see business? Because one of the things I noticed in your sizzle reel is that you said, it's not important to own things. It's important to have access. Right. So the virtual company. So one of the chapters is that remote workers are now your secret sauce. So I've run remote companies. I did my first company out, out of my house when my kids were little. They knew the game. If the phone rang and daddy's on, who can stay quiet the longest? Got a toy. Because <laughs> they got, did they get paid for that? They get paid for staying quiet? <laughs> Absolutely. They were part of the team. Um, but with remote workers, throughout history, you could only hire the best people to live within 10 or 20 miles of, of, your, of your office. Yeah. Now you can hire the best people on the planet. Not only will people appreciate that, remote workers will be willing to work for 15% less in just the US. Um, internationally, there's markets where people get paid a lot less. They have less turnover. So you're not constantly losing people. And you get to pull from the best of the best anywhere. Um, if you ever use 99 designs to make a logo, this proves the point. Mm -hmm. I always, after I do it, I, yep. I ask fiber. the person, where mm -hmm. are you from? And they could be from anywhere or moonlighting. So, so that's a competitive advantage. I also outline the 22 most powerful free software tools for running businesses remotely. Mm -hmm. Because you now can't walk around the office and see who's in a, in a funk or, you know, there, there's vibes for keeping your team and, and, and managing people at a distance. So that's a huge change. And corporations now will be downsizing. So over the next five years, you're going to see half of the jobs in the U.S. disappear. Mm. So massive unemployment. So if you think you have that secure job and that's why you didn't start your business, there are no secure jobs. 100-year-old companies disappear. Anybody can disappear. The pandemic showed that anything can happen. So... You can either believe in fate and destiny and sit back and let what comes to you, or you can take control of your future in an uncertain world. Mm. And that's what future proofing is that no matter what gets thrown at you, you have the tools to take that disruption. And disruption isn't about what happens to you, it's how you respond to what happens to you. So, why Absolutely. did the wealthiest respond in a way that made them even wealthier? And why did others, and you don't, have to have 
anything other than that persistence and insight. Right. Well, I think the wealthiest, you know, saw opportunity and took massive action, right? No, I mean, <laughs> we, we all see opportunity differently, uh, but the opportunity is all around. Absolutely. And there's no shortage of capital. There's no shortage of, of ways of getting started. Do you have mentorship programs? Do you, do you oh, mentor first? people? Uh huh. No, I don't. I I don't have the time or bandwidth, which is why I write my books because it scales. I mean, I've heard from people in Pakistan. I've heard from people four corners of the earth from 140 countries that the books have helped. I'm not doing this to make money. I'm doing this. The world's been kind to me. Here's how I can pay it forward. So this was my first time actually taking the time with one person. And I did it so that I could record it, memorialize it, and future-proofing you and have that knowledge scale. I also did it with the selfish reason that my life pre-pandemic was flying around the world giving speeches and, and teaching governments and businesses how to do this. Um, now I've made a protege, and he can go and go do it. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, so what's next for you? You have the book launch. What, what, what is the official launch date? Um, March 23rd. Okay. March 23rd. Uh, I'll make sure I'll go buy my copy. You need to go get extra rich. <laughs> yeah. and I have an extra rich. Don't you I? do have it. Well, yeah. I sent it to you so you would write a testimonial, yeah. of course. Right. Um, and if people want a workbook to get started right now, go to my website, jsamet.com. There's free workbooks for each of my books that you can do exercises to get the most out of it. And the other big thing that I'm passionate about is I can't believe that we figured out as a society that the best way to grow food is to pour tons of poison on it mm -hmm. that kills birds, plants, weeds, and insects, but it won't affect us. And now we're finding out what a shock. It causes cancer and kills us. So a young engineer that had worked for me years ago when I was running Sony came to me with an idea. What if instead of poisoning the weeds, we just make a, think of a Roomba, a little robot that goes up and down the rows of soy or, or corn or whatever and just kills the weeds, cuts them off. So now we have swarms of these robots, the company's called Greenfield Robotics, and A, it takes the pesticides out of the food, it's good for us. B, that means the farmer makes more money per acre, he doesn't have to spray and do all that. C, most farms still till the soil to chop up the weeds, mm -hmm. well that releases greenhouse gases. The majority, the single largest source of greenhouse gases warming this planet are from farming, not from cars and factories. So we can stop that. Then the chemicals that didn't get into your system and poison you would go down the Mississippi and kill all the fish in the Gulf of Mexico. So now we can have healthier food and a healthier planet. So I felt morally obligated to step in as executive chairman and get the company to the next level. And uh, it, it's, it's, again, solve a problem that no one else is focused on. Yeah. So now yeah. Our, our mom and pop farmers and big farmers can make a living. In 2020, no farm in the US made a profit. If it wasn't for government subsidies, we'd lose our food supply. And with changing uh, climate uh, around the planet, food is going to go up tremendously in cost unless we solve this huge problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just, fortunate to, to, you know, that a team called me that figured it out. So mm -hmm. that's why I love talking about entrepreneurs. There's always somebody with a new solution to a problem that nobody else took the time to solve. Mm -hmm. And what about Deloitte Digital? What, what is that company? What are you doing with that company? So I was on the board. Uh, Deloitte is a 250 year old company, uh, mm -hmm. does $45 billion a year, about 7% of that's accounting. All the rest is consulting. So, wow, so, only 7% of that is accounting. Yep. So, they brought me in the same as every big company does. How do you change things? How do you modernize? How do you figure it out? So, so uh, that was, that was a, a, fun, a fun couple of years uh, being vice chairman. Mm. So, do you have your own company that you also run or? You mostly helping other entrepreneurs grow their businesses. Um, I, I'm not money motivated. I mean, I don't need any more. I can't spend what I have. Um, 
So it's how can I give back? So yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I didn't think I'd write another book, but that one email just so bothered me that somehow I wasn't getting through. Um, so, you know, I have a few clients that I can't say no to. I'll tell you the funniest call I got last year. Um, Google, who I've worked with many times, uh, called and wanted to hire me as a consultant. I said, wait a second, guys. When I want to know something, I Google it. What could I possibly know that you don't know? You have floors, <laughs> buildings filled with the brightest minds from around the world. And um, it, it turned out that they had nobody with my unique skill set um, of how you uh, scale and bring things to market as they start getting into the hardware business. So that was fun. Wow. So, so I predict so, the future by hanging out with those that are coding it. What's so that? Supply, I, the way I'm able to accurately predict the future is I'm constantly hanging out with those that are coding it. Mm -hmm. So I know what Facebook's working on. I know what Apple's working on. I know what Microsoft and Google and, and whatever. And then I apply that to what holes are they not addressing, but they built all these great tools that anybody can use. Think back again, 10 years ago when the iPhone came out, you can't live without a smartphone today. It's the first thing you see in the morning, you run your business, you run your life, you go to bed. But 10 years ago when it came out, the, one of the top 10 apps was the fart app. <laughs> so nobody could figure out let's do open table let's do robin hood let's do tons of businesses that became so yeah. you can't go back 10 years but in future proofing you i tell everybody about a trillion dollar opportunity that no one has a one percent share of that starts this coming christmas and you won't be using your phone anymore and your life will completely change it'll be bigger than internet bigger than smartphones bigger than the pc and why not solve a problem in that space where you have no competition? The big guys are spending billions. Hmm. Interesting. So what is it going to be? <laughs> Spatial reality. We're Spatial all going to wear heads up displays mm -hmm. that will give us information. Mm -hmm. And so we're no longer searching for information. Information comes to us based on where we are. Mm -hmm. You went to the, the doctor and the doctor said, uh, you have high blood pressure. You can't have food with salt. You could go through the supermarket and pick up every single box and spend four months in there. Or you could just say, show me the products with no salt and everything else will disappear off the shelves. There's a company doing this right now. Um, you know, you don't remember where you parked your car. There's a line to find it. Endless possibilities. Um, and these glasses are amazing. And remember, last year, people spent $150 or more a pair to buy 80 million pairs of glasses that came with one app. Focus. You're wearing a pair of them right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they bought another 50 million pair that came with a different app called Sun. Mm -hmm. Sunglasses. So people are happy to wear glasses if it solves a problem. And then we have to have both. We have to have our regular prescription glasses and then our prescription sunglasses. <laughs> well... Now you have glasses that will adjust with you and do that and talk to you as well. So augment, augmentation isn't just visual. It's also uh, hearing. All right. One um, thing that you mentioned in your sizzle reel that I thought was interesting and obviously very true is that, uh, you know, you can be on a plane and, and everybody pays different amounts for their seats. But even in a, in a, in a grocery store that I can have the same amount of products in my cart that somebody else has in their cart and we're paying different amounts based upon what information or what data sure. a company has on us. That's extremely and it's interesting. Going to be, so, I mean, Amazon got caught for this for a few years ago, but if you're a regular Amazon customer and you always buy from Prime, you're actually charged more per item than a person first time on the site. Mm. Now, that would seem counterintuitive. You go, why are you penalizing your good customer? Well, your, your best customer isn't comparison shopping. Now, they, they got negative backlash for that and dealt with it. But let's now go to the physical Whole Foods stores that Amazon's rolling out. Facial recognition identifies you when you walk in the store and you push your cart. Whatever goes into your cart gets charged on your account. There's no cash register. There's no cashier. So you're just putting products in and you're, you're walking out with them. Well, you have no idea what you're paying compared to the next person and the next person and what brands will give you a discount because of past buying history or want to convert you. So everything becomes dynamic pricing. With heads up display, 
you now shorten the marketing and sales cycle. So if I'm in my self-driving car and it knows I haven't eaten lunch and it's two o'clock and it knows that every day I usually have eaten by now and four times a week I eat at McDonald's and there's one 1,600 feet ahead while I'm driving, a big floating free French fry will appear. And if I grab it, then the car will know to drive through and, and give me my food. If you think this is far-fetched, this is reality. Oh, no, and, I believe it. That's why I'm laughing because, yeah. But it's also serious stuff. Imagine yeah. the firefighters, the bravest people in the world, going in a smoke-filled building. Now their glasses can, can tie into the plans of the building the city already has so they know where the stairs are, where the, where the walls are, where, where water is or whatever. Right. Your, your construction site, where do you dig in the ground? You know, now you can see that they're see through the ground like Superman, where there's gas pipes and everything else. Endless. But here's the thing, just like with the apps on the phone, you have a problem in your life right now that isn't being addressed. This can solve it. No one else is focused on that. All right. Sure. Google could make an app that does that, but they want to make sure they own the glasses or they go out of business if you're no longer looking at your phone to search. And if Apple doesn't sell you the glasses, they go out of business. So the big guys are looking for the big giant chunks of real estate in the future. They're happy if you make a billion. Mm. And this is all going to develop within the next couple of years, right? Yep. The, the, your... the, the first, first versions of stuff come out around Christmas this year that are pretty impressive. What's your prediction on like office space and parking garages and all of that? Do you see? So I wouldn't want to own a whole lot of high rise buildings right now, because when a company like Nationwide, again, I say every company is a tech company, they're an insurance company, but what are they? They're moving ones and zeros across computers. In 30 days into the pandemic, they moved 98% of their employees to work from home mm -hmm. and they're not coming back. Goldman Sachs, they're not coming back. The, the, the big edifice where everybody has to commute and give up three hours a day to go in and go home. Why not spend that three hours with your family? So you're going to see that's one change. The second change to real estate. Well, if I don't need to commute to downtown, I don't need to commute to this giant place with 5,000 people in one building. I also don't need to live in this major city that's costing a fortune to live. Right. You know, for you could make $300,000 a year in Silicon Valley and can't afford, you know, a two bedroom apartment. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you could work. And what millennials are doing, millennials are now pre pandemic, this trend happened, or traveling more than, than seniors. So if you can work remotely, why not work in Thailand this month and next month in Rio and the month after in Berlin and travel the world and have a work life balance that is satisfying? And then you'll have less turnover. It's interesting. The most sought after places to work, the, the Googles and, 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 and the Facebooks, they get the best of the best from the top universities. They pay a fortune. They hire the, the smartest minds. And yet average retention is less than two and a half years. So something's not working in this system. So, you know, we saw what happened to malls as real estate. Now we're seeing mm -hmm. what happens to, to high rises. And now what's going to happen with dense urban areas. So mm -hmm. You're now free to start your business anywhere, hire people from anywhere and sell to everywhere. What a great time. Absolutely. One thing that you mentioned too, that I thought was interesting because I have teams of people in all my companies, uh, any given time on five to 10 different businesses that I build to sell. But if they don't make a mistake in a year, you get rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to my that, people and say, make mistakes. <laughs> I've told that to my direct reports for years because- if you're in something new, if you're trying something new, the only way to figure out what works is to not be afraid to try and not be afraid to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And if you're afraid to make mistakes, you shouldn't be working with me because we're Well, then you're playing it things. safe and you're not growing. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I also tell every employee that they don't work for, for me. I work for them. Their job is to tell me what they need to be successful. Mm -hmm. What do you need to achieve your job? And if I get it to you and you don't do it, then I know it's your fault, but I'm not a mind reader. Mm -hmm. So if you don't tell me what you need to succeed, so you can create entrepreneurs, you can create people that create value and start businesses, even in the largest of companies. And I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, 
Amazing. So any last minute thoughts or, or advice that you have? I know we, you know, about exiting businesses, which we kind of already talked about, but any last minute wisdom that you want to share with entrepreneurs, existing business owners, people that are suffering during this pandemic? Of the people that become self-made millionaires and billionaires today, many have never made a profit. And that's hard for people with their small business to understand. If you start with the idea of an exit of who needs what you're doing, and I'll take the example of Greenfield Robotics, we're solving, everybody knows if you could get rid of chemicals and farming and, and carcinogenic stuff on our food, everybody would do that. So if we're able to do that, who does that impact? Well, the, the billion dollar companies that make the chemicals, they don't want to poison people. That's not their thing. They're, they're just trying to stay in business. So they would become the billion dollar company that has robots. Or if you're the guys that sell those big giant combines and tractors, well, maybe they should have a robotics division. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a car manufacturer and people aren't going to be owning cars the way they did in the past, what else could you convert your factories to do? So suddenly I've now identified what I call 800 pound gorillas, some giant, giant companies that it is inevitable that they have to go where I am. It's like I own the state of Arizona and the railroad barons are coming from the East Coast to get to California. I don't know which one will get there first, but they're all coming. And so it's not about how profitable I can be, it's how far can I grab and hold on to as much land as possible. Mm -hmm. So what was amazing to me is how open farmers were to this and how it reminds me of the early days of PCs where we all helped each other and talked to each other, it wasn't competition, where every farmer knows every other farmer. And before you know it, the, the whole country, we have 300 million acres of, of land that, that, that this could work for. I mean, that's massive. And what, what, what giant company wouldn't wanna instantly get into that business and not have to say, I gotta hire guys and write software, it's why, Tesla is valued more than all the auto companies put together. Mm -hmm. Their software is so far ahead of, if you hired the brightest people today to make a self-driving car, wouldn't do what my Tesla does. So that's just the way I look at it. So I start from the exit. Mm -hmm. I start from, but exit rich, but don't be greedy. That, that, that's what I would add to your, your title. Because if you wait for that, that giant magical number, you're, may have missed the bird in the hand. Yeah, that's that's a great point because so like you said before, so many so many entrepreneurs pass up on their first offer or their second offer because they want more. And then, you know, two or three, four years later, they're out of business. <laughs> I've seen that happen time and time again. What about the one that had the hundred million dollar offer? Did they end up taking it or did they pass on that? Oh no, they 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 didn't take it. I resigned from the board. We haven't spoken since and they've now <laughs> raised more and more. Their business is nothing and it, you know, I don't get it. No. But and I don't come from this as here's some old guy like he knows everything. When I was in my 20s, I had a company that had seven of the top 10 selling video games in the world. And mm -hmm. along came another company and said, we would like to buy your company. We'll give you a third of our company. And I'm like, that's stock. Well, it could go down in value. I don't, won't have control. I don't know what's going on. And I turned down Activision, which is an $18 billion company today. So turning down you know, billions in your 20s Educate you not to make that mistake again and to try to prevent others from making that mistake. Mm. You know, Mark Cuban, he had a technology that we were working with, broadcast back, back then, that really didn't work, but he sold it at the right time. Mm -hmm. He sold it to Yahoo in a way that, that, that protected the, the stock. When Yahoo went down, he had collared his stock and became a billionaire for something that never had any revenue. Yeah. Yeah. So- Deal structure. I have a whole chapter that explains, you know, Spielberg became a billionaire not from making movies. You know, uh, George Lucas became a billionaire not from being a director or a writer. And you see that, you know, McDonald's, you know, Ray Kroc made his money not from making hamburgers, but from, not real, from estate. real estate. From real estate. It's how you structure the deal. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing I would say is just as I say, you need mentors, 
there are people with the skill sets like you that have been through these steps that don't try to have some pride that you can do it on your own because all that you'll do is you will make your first mistakes. Mm -hmm. Why not benefit from somebody that's made those mistakes? Right. Absolutely. So you are, you know, you think differently than most people. I, what, what is it about you that, what is it about you? <laughs> you oh. think so much differently than everybody else. It's kind of like, it's kind of like Jeff Hoffman. Have you met Jeff Hoffman? I know who he is. Yeah. Founder of the airport kiosk and, you know, one of the co-founders of Priceline, but you think very differently than everybody else. What makes you think so differently? I mean, if we could just change the way that people think about things. If I, if I had to give credit to anything, I believe it's because I'm dyslexic. Uh -huh. I don't think literally I connect the dots. One out of three entrepreneurs of a fortune 500 company are dyslexic, you know, all this, you know, all. So, what they told me as a child was a handicap and you're stupid turns out to be my superpower. And so I really talk about in future proofing you about that everybody I believe has a superpower and if you can identify it. And I talk about this one young kid who was in middle school and had ADHD, right? Just couldn't, couldn't calm the mind. And they wanted to load him up on drugs and he's walking around in the zone like so many. And, but when he was in the pool, he could calm himself. So he said, if I agree to swim every day, will you take me off these drugs? And the doctors and his parents said, yes. And he swam every day and he swam every day. And he's won more Olympic medals than anybody else. That's Michael <laughs> Phelps? Yeah. So his superpower isn't swimming. His superpower was his ADHD. So embrace what makes you unique. And again, you won't have any competition. And yeah, so yeah. I've seen so many people that, you know, I have a friend that's a super connector. He just meets everybody, talks to everybody, and can put A and B together and has never had to have a job. Um, it's a great skill. You know, Reed Hoffman, you know, first guy to put money into Facebook, uh, you know, LinkedIn, you know, go on and on and on, PayPal. He can see the future better than anybody I've ever met. It's as if he's been there, right? He just absorbs so much data, so much information as a voracious reader and meter and doer that he, you know, you know, he saw Airbnb when nobody else. So I'm talking about, you know, first checks to when it's, you know, a crazy investment. Um, wow. But everybody has some gift. And if you want to find your gift, and I talk about it in Future Proofing You, why do your friends come to you for advice on? That's a, that's a key. You'll start, you'll start noticing other people recognize what your superpower is mm -hmm. and now learn to harness that you know les brown i mean he was told by his teachers that he's mentally or education what's the word they use educational challenge retarded. yeah well they call him retarded and um terrible 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 you know richard branson's like, school uh headmaster said said to him that you're either going to end up in prison or be very, very successful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that. Find a superpower. So most successful people have daily rituals, daily habits. What's yours? Um, well, one, I want to make sure that I have that positive mindset. So mm -hmm. I start off each day and I look in the mirror as crazy as it sounds. And I say, today can be better than yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I have the power to make it so. Mm -hmm. And that sets off endorphins that lights up your synaptic nerves and puts you in a mood to be receptive to positivity and things right, that can happen. Yeah. And I'll give you an example because this one shocked me and I don't shock myself often. So when the pandemic hit in my typical pre-pandemic, uh, January, 2020, I was in four continents, 12 countries. That was my typical life. All of a sudden, boom, I'm going to be locked in the house. And I figured, I didn't know we'd be incompetent as a nation, but I figured maybe we'd be in the house 60 days, 90 days, a hundred days. Um, and I wanted to show people that the pandemic can have a silver lining. There was something positive. No, if you get the disease, you die. It's miserable, obviously. But it was also a gift of time. You know, I'm not running around. I'm not doing anything. So I want to prove to the world that I can take advantage and have this positive mindset, even in the worst of times. So something I've always done privately and never shared in the business world is I paint. I paint. I'm a watercolorist. So I decided I would put up a painting every day in social media. 
much to my surprise, I was just doing it to motivate people that they could do something with their time. People like my art. Art That's dealers like my art. Gallery owners like my art. Fast forward in September, I had a solo show in New York. I can't believe this. I didn't get to attend because of COVID. My artwork's being sold. I'm getting commissions from famous people. I am now an artist. Now, I didn't set out to make money as an artist. I didn't set out to launch a business. I just wanted to have a positive mindset. That's amazing. So you're still selling art? Yes, it's crazy. <laughs> I have to go check out your art. Yeah, jsamatart.com. Um, wow. So you're a man of very many talents. <laughs> I would rather wear out than rust. <laughs> Anything you would do differently if you, if you had to go back and change things? Or what would you tell your younger self? Since I have what I consider a perfect life, whatever pain, and there was much of it that I've gone through that got me my great kids, my great wife, and my, my you know, happy life, um, I, I wouldn't want to risk changing any of it. Um, if I would whisper in the ear, I would say, don't give up. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're ever bored, I did a commencement speech to university, which sounds fun until you realize there's thousands of people sitting there and you're the only thing between them and having a party. Right? <laughs> um, it's not like a business conference. They don't want to learn. So, but it was actually my favorite speech that I ever gave. And it was about all my friends from college. And we were all stubborn back to persistence. And as I unpeel the onion and tell the story, you, the listener, the audience know every single one of my friends from college because they all became super famous. Now we didn't go to a special school. I went to public state school, UCLA, but they never gave up in the most insane areas that you could think of. <laughs> and that's the message. Yeah, the never give history up. was created by the stubborn. Be stubborn. Don't listen to naysayers. You'll never meet a hater that's doing better than you are. Mm. I think that's why I'm so successful. I'm so stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> and I raised my kids. I didn't raise my kids with the, what do you want to be when you grow up? What problem do you want to solve when you grow up? Mm. Right? Yeah. Have that positive mindset. And, you know, I'm super proud dad. It's crazy. Can't believe that these, these kids are as amazing as they've turned out to be as adults. And, and uh, you know, looking to have my influence on my grandkids now. Do you have grandkids? Yeah. Two of them. Two little girls. Awesome. Congratulations. I have a 10 year old daughter. Oh, you're so, going into some challenging years. Yes, I am. I'm teaching her about entrepreneurship, teaching her about what problems do you see? How do you solve those? Be a problem solver, be a solution. When, when my, when my uh, youngest was 10 or 11, uh, eBay, we'd gotten it off the ground. It was, it was, well-known, everybody's using eBay. And I went down to New Orleans to, uh, we had our annual you know, convention mm -hmm. and I've got to do meetings and I can't babysit them. So, so I said, just walk around. You know, these are people that sell stuff and figure out. And so he was very self-confident young man. And he comes back, goes, dad, I know what I'm going to sell on eBay. I've got my eBay business. I go, okay, what? Remember 11 years old. And you now know, because you have a 10 year old, they could do this. Said, you know what drop shipping is? I go, yeah. I don't even have to touch anything, get anything. There are companies that will send it directly. I said, that's smart. What are you going to do? I said, number two, what I realized is if you, what any item you sell, somebody could be selling it for less. So don't sell a single item. Group things together to obfuscate. He didn't use that word, but to obfuscate yeah. the price and make it look like your value. I said, that makes sense too. And I'm just like beaming with joy. I go, now comes the punchline. So what are you going to sell? Martial arts weapons. <laughs> <laughs> so he was taking Taekwondo at the time. So his first month, he made like $1,200 profit. Wow. At 11 years old. Yeah. And the sad part of growing up where, you know, money isn't a driving force in the household, he then had proved it to himself. So he stopped doing it, right? There's no reason to make more money. He doesn't need any. But I was like so proud of the thought process that took him to do that. It's solving a problem, finding a void. Yeah. And if you well, he can, was able to do that because he has you. He has a good role model. That's but that's if you can about. if you can get young people thinking that way, mm -hmm. just imagine what this world would be well, then like. That's your next book, Jay. 
doing it for kids. Actually, <laughs> doing it for a kids. teacher from a, a poor school district uh, reached out to me after uh, future proofing you. I mean, after uh, disrupt you and said, you know what? I, I love your book. Can I adapt it to make it a high school curriculum and a high school book so that young people know that they have a choice between fast food and prison? I'm like, mm -hmm. here's the rights, do it for free, do whatever you want. She not only did a great job, she won teacher of the year. Wow. And when she did that, I then leaned on HP and said, you know, guys, you guys are such great printers and do all this. Why don't you print copies for all the boys and girls clubs so that, you know, everybody can see that they have opportunity. Wow. People need role models that show them it's possible. Mm -hmm. So did they do that? Did HP do that? Yeah. yeah. Amazing. But I think you got to get them before high school, though. I think you got to get them when they're little. You know, like the eight, nine, 10, and 11. I couldn't right? agree more. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing. Any last minute thoughts? Any last no, minute thoughts? Thank you for being wisdom? generous with your time and, and for the listeners. And, you know, I, I believe that everyone can achieve if they, you know, with the, with the mind conceives, the body can achieve. And so I agree, a thousand percent. And thank you for supporting Exit Rich. I'm actually going to go by um, Proofing You, Future Proofing You. I already have Disrupt You, but you haven't signed it. I meant to get you to sign it last time we ran into each other. <laughs> I think that was at City Summit. Oh. We ran into each other. So yeah. I will go support you. Tell all of our listeners um, where they can find you again. And we'll make sure uh, you have all the information. jsamit.com, J-A-Y-S-A-M-I-T. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, all the usual places. Okay. And uh, look forward to hearing from readers of what they're creating. Yep. And I, I encourage everyone to go out and, of course, get Exit Rich, but more importantly, go get Future Proofing You. I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you so much for all of our listeners. Thank you, Jay, especially. And thanks to all of our listeners for another episode of Exit Rich. Thanks for listening to the Exit Rich podcast. Don't forget to check out Michelle Seiler Tucker's Build to Sell Blueprint books and Exit Rich, along with more blogs, videos, and resources at ExitRichPodcast.com. Be sure to connect with Michelle on Facebook or LinkedIn and stay tuned for her next episode by subscribing in your favorite podcast player.